We're extremely lucky to have one of Atlanta's and America's leading CEOs joining us again this year, Delta Airlines CEO Ed Bastian. The man stuck up to the plate when it came to COVID. And John Hope Bryant. I don't mind being biased. This is one of the coolest CEOs on the planet. And unluckily for him, he's also my friend, which means I bug him all the time. But how did I start wearing tennis shoes with suits? You, he you've, uh, I think you've outdone me here, John. <laughs> I, I don't know. I got to step my game up here. No, you're looking good. I, I, I was, last night I was in New York, and uh, Danny Meyer, he's the founder of Union Square Hospitality. I was at his restaurant, and, and he came by. And he, he started wearing sneakers also. He's, he's following us. It's very and, comfortable and professional. I'm going to give a plug. I don't know if it's appropriate or not, but he had these pair of shoes that one shoe was called Optimism and the other shoe is called Joy. Mm. And it's, and I might have those words wrong, but it's essentially that. And it's K-Swiss, I'll tell you the brand. And you can go out there and find those. And I hope everyone, you have know, one foot, and you were just reminding about optimism and joy, and that's what we bring the world. Hope and opportunity. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, so um, Ed Bastian is, in addition to being the Matt Damon of the airline industry, because he's so handsome, um, really is what you think he is. I mean, what you see is what you get. Um, but let me go, let me go deeper. Um, you, def you can really source out uh, how and who somebody is by what happens when nobody's looking and what happens in tough times. Uh, Ed and I, a couple touch points. We went on Squawk Box to announce uh, uh, $2 billion worth of profit sharing. So he made sure that once he hit the mark for his, employ for his shareholders, that any dollar above that got shared with line employees. Just ran into one of his flight attendants in uh, the hallway in the back. She's out here somewhere. That's right, we wanted a photo. And one of your flight attendants put a, uh, gave me a Black Lives Matter uh, Delta Airlines yep. Yep. Uh, button just yesterday, which I have in my pocket, um, which you supported. And uh, so, he wanted to share this prosperity with all, which is why when you get on a Delta Airlines flight, the flight attendants don't have an attitude. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you noticed, they're pleasant. The, the ground crew is pleasant. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, the, the, the folks at the, count, the ticket counter, how you doing? Yes, right over here. Because they're shareholders. They're participants uh, in the upward mobility of the company. But right after we did that, the pandemic hit and the brakes hit. And let me back up and say a year before that, there was a crisis. There was somebody out here bragging about you last night. I forget which CEO. It was Fortune Magazine's editor was bragging about you last night, by the way, that when the, I won't name names, but when a certain organization, uh, which you thought was inappropriate uh, for our values, you got into a bit of, they got into a bit of an issue, and you took issue with the issue and said you would not, you know, sponsors anymore. You, so you guys will figure out the rest of this. Um, the state legislature here, some became punitive. And most CEOs would back down, Ed never flinched. So this is 2019. You know what I'm talking about, that's right. It's 2019. So now we're at 2020, uh, and he's given a billion dollars away in 2019 to his employees, two billion dollars plus in 2020. The pandemic hits the next month, all of a sudden the company's in a tailspin, nobody's flying. People are now wondering, is this business plan viable. The, he never had to lay off one employee. They took a voluntary, what's it called? Just took voluntary time off. It's not a, it's, it's not a furlough, is it? No, no, but they, they, it, it was all optional. People would, you know, month after month after month, just agree to stay home, which was, by the way, because of the pandemic, the lower level of flying, we needed less employees uh, for no pay. And we said, recover your, your, uh, your benefits, of course. And then everyone had their own choice. And we had 50% of our company do that for the bulk of last year without paying, without paying a dime for them. But because of the, the investment that we made in the bank, 
over time about how important, how important this company is. And they did that to save the jobs of younger people. And to save the company. And, and, when, company. and, when, and when, so when COVID began to ease up and people began to fly again, they had their strongest return to earnings of any airline in the country because it, everybody was waiting to support them and their employees were waiting to come back. Uh, so the employees felt that they were with you in the good times, but they also backed you Absolutely. in the tough times. Uh, and in the midst of all this, we had been talking to your people about Hope Inside the Workplace. And uh, once again, it was ahead of his time. 2018, he greenlit us uh, putting a pilot into uh, the HR department. Not everybody was a believer. They didn't want well, nothing negative. They just didn't think that this was relevant for their people. Now, I'm not going to give the numbers yet because I don't know if this is public information, but maybe you can. But I get a call from somebody very senior in Delta, not it, saying we have a problem. A good number of our employees, and they're the biggest employer in, in Georgia, by the way, a good number of our employees have not taken an emergency 401k loan in 2020. I mean, this is a big number. And it, so it wasn't a protest, wasn't some lines around the corner. They just did it on the internet at midnight and took a loan. And they're not going to end up paying that loan back in all likelihood. It's over a billion dollars of loan. So, okay, he sold the number. Listen now, it's 80,000 employees at Delta. 80,000. Not every employee took the loan. But some portion of that 80,000 was in such a struggle. They, a billion dollars in emergency loans in one year. One year, one company. Imagine what that number is nationwide for all companies. The number's unbelievable. Nobody talks about it. Ed's talking about it. They said, look, we have to do something about this. So they then went from zero to 12 Hope Inside locations across the country to help their employees do financial coaching with us in every place around the country at no cost to any employee. Thank you. These are the things that happen behind the scenes that you don't hear about. I'll tell you one last, and I'm going to shut up. I get a call from Ed, and again, I'm not going to betray his confidences here. I get a call from Ed at 9 o'clock one night. I know exactly where I was. I was in Peachtree City. And you said, John, I'm struggling with something. Uh, and it was the right to vote issue. Sorry, it was the voting issue here in Georgia. Make a long story short, he said to me, John, I got this wrong. I first thought I'm trying to make sure that a bad thing doesn't happen, meaning I'm trying to pull the agrarious parts of the legislation, the negative parts out of the legislation, try to keep the bad things from happening. But after the conversation with me and others, he said, now I am putting myself in the, the shoes of my employees and my shareholders and my community and those who are black, who fought and gave their lives to vote in the 1960s. And putting myself in their shoes, I can't just not do the bad thing. Hold on now. I got to do the good thing. So I have to say, this is wrong. He comes out the next day, all heck breaks loose. I can't say what I really want to say. Oh, all hell breaks loose. A hundred CEOs come right behind him. Boom, boom. We're with you, Ed. We're with you, Ed. We're with you, Ed. Now you have an entire nation of, of CEOs. But it took one. It took one who had the backbone to say, this is my business because it's our business. Because the right to vote, I think I'm quoting you here, is sacred. Absolutely. And like other things, it's not for sale. Woo! Now, let's be clear. We're not against, it. there's nothing against anything here. Who is not, who's against the right to vote? We're just saying it should be protected. It's just saying on my watch, we're going to support everybody, everybody, black and white, red and blue, anybody. You know, we're going to support everybody. And but 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 you, I guess my whole point here is over. I want to get your reflections on this social justice moment we've been experiencing and how it's affected you personally, uh, because you could just turn away. You've done very well. You could, you could get a, a, some kind of a town car, drive you to work and ignore it. But you don't. Yeah. Um, what does all this mean to you as a leader? How has it touched you or affected you as a leader and, 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 and the way you lead? And what do you think this is as a, as a signal for the business plan for America? Yeah. Well, 
First of all, John, thank you for that's probably the best, longest introduction I've ever had. So I, uh, <laughs> and by the way, we could just keep going for another 10 minutes and we'll, and we'll wrap this sucker up. That'd be great. But I, I love you too, brother. Love you. Too. Uh, what, you know, we're in a, a, a time of change and it's really clear. And I know people have said that before and I know promises have been made that haven't been kept. I know corporations have pledged to go do the right things time and time and time again, and unfortunately, they turned into more check the box type things to, to show that they're they're there, but there was no there was no personal accountability, mm. no personal ownership yep. of, of of the topic. Yep. We need to own this, and this is not something we delegate to our HR department to own people or HR matters. It has to start at the very top mm. of the company. And when I talk about my own personal view on these topics, whether it's on, on equity and inclusion, the <clears throat> diversity of our workforce, the, the opportunities to, to, to give people a better chance for the future. I'm talking to my 80,000 employees. I'm talking to my hometown here in Atlanta, yep. where I'm the largest employer in town. I'm talking to our state. And I know everyone doesn't agree with me, and that's okay. Mm. But we have to have a point of view, and we have to have a personal sense of accountability and responsibility in making it happen. And specifically to my employees, I, I think of Delta as a family. Mm. Those are 80,000 family members, mm. some of whom I know have been impacted for very, in various ways <coughs> over this, particularly over this last couple of years, in very negative ways. Yeah. So whether it's their financial wellness, their emotional well-being, their physical health, their social health, yeah. I've got to be there for them. And the pandemic, if it did one thing to us all, it quieted this world. Mm -hmm. It made us all stop and watch and none of us could take our eyes off what happened to George Floyd mm. that day. Mm. And none of us could, could, could in good conscience say, how can that possibly happen yeah. in today's America? And what do I personally need to do to make sure it doesn't happen again? Yeah. And that goes deep into, into this level. And it starts with though, having that personal accountability and responsibility to make change happen. Where do we go from here? Um, with all of this, uh, corporations, I think, since the CEO of Coca-Cola's uh, age, Robert Woodruff, have shown you can do well and do good, mm -hmm. but that for a long time, that sort of disappeared. Mm -hmm. Folks are just focused on profit. Now it, it appears it's coming back, mm -hmm. and I feel it's being baked in uh, that you've got to have something above the line and below the line as far as your uh, purpose in order to make a profit and have shareholder yeah. value. So what's your opinion about that? I, I do also think that there is a view by some of my uh, white brothers and sisters that somehow by blacks and minorities finally getting some recognition that somehow this is a zero-sum game for them, that's an incorrect narrative. There are four things that have never gone backwards in American society. Real estate values, stock values, they go up, correct, come back higher, correct, go back higher. GDP, gross domestic product, and the prospects of a, of a college-educated 55-year-old white man in the history of this country have never gone backwards. There's enough room for everybody. It's just that you can't grow this economy with just anymore 55-year-old college-educated white men. It's just not enough to go around. That's right. You need everybody. You need everybody. So, so we're talking about st expanding the table and adding a chair, mm -hmm. and there's nobody that should feel threatened. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't. You're not threatened by somebody else coming up, it seems like the opposite is true. It's, it, it's, it's completely the opposite. You know, you, you say that it's the good thing to do, it's the right thing to do, it's also the smart thing to do. Our differences make us stronger. Mm. Our dif that's what our country was founded on, mm. is, is our differences, and the fact that we, we welcomed for decades and decades and decades people from around the world to help build this country. We've all come from someplace, yeah. right? And we need to continue to be a welcoming, di diverse, strengthened by our differences, because I think we have a, you know, and, and the, the American dream, while a lot of people question, you know, that's our responsibility to keep it alive. As you travel the world, you're, you're, you're in how many countries? Oh, uh, we're. You guys, did you guys want to give some applause? Yeah, I just yeah, cut yeah, you off. Yeah, yeah, I'm, so, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, we absolutely. travel. 
Well, we're, we're, we're not there yet because of the uh, because of the pandemic. When we're full up next year, we'll be back to over 60 countries around the world. 60 countries you travel to. Yeah. So when you travel around the world yourself, are you seeing that the position, that the way in which you've led, and the way in which the company has led at Delta has enhanced your reputation in around the world, and has also enhanced maybe the way you've, you've been able to do business? Oh, it it it, it clearly has. I mean. It, the the level of political divisiveness that we see in our country today, it's it's hard to look at, but it's also not to other parts of the world. You know, other parts of the world breaking away. You had Brexit, right? Right. Breaking away. We, we don't talk about it anymore, but right. it, but it happened. You had you had Great Britain Brexit. Yeah, yeah. You have you have so many different local issues going on on a global stage that sometimes the U.S. stuff we kind of get mired in what's going on here. This is this is a human condition. Right. That people Globally. want pe people want to have voice. People want to have opportunity, and the pandemic, not just in our country but around the world, created a greater, a much greater divide between the haves and the have-nots. You look at what's happened in the stock market yeah. as a perfect illustration. I saw saw a stat today that now 10% of the wealthiest Americans have 90% of the value of the stock market. Wow. 10% have controlled 90%. Wow. I've never seen that level of divide yeah. in the past. Yeah. And if that's not a wake up call, yeah. that this, this isn't gonna be a happy ending right. where this thing is going. Right. So I think it is a call to action. Tell us a little bit about, <clears throat> as we pivot here, tell us a little bit about uh, what you're doing at Delta uh, that they may not be aware of, that you're proud of, and you're or, or either frustrated with, play out proud of, or in or planning. And then let's, I want you to end with a vision for the future that you think is achievable for most leaders, uh, let's just limit this to the private sector, you know, what do you think are the tools in their toolbox that will make them better as leaders going forward? But let's start with Delta. So, so at Delta, you know, the pandemic showed us the power of our people. Our, people, people. our, our people got us through this, mm -hmm. right? It was, it was hard, it was difficult. While many people were staying at their homes and being served by others, you know, we had to go out and fly. Mm -hmm. we, we had to go deliver people. We had to get people to the front lines of the medical crisis. We needed to keep the supply chains open. We needed to get <clears throat> families to emergency to bedside as, as people were suffering in, uh, in, in really dire straits. And even if only five people were on a plane, we were, we were carrying those flights, and we didn't stop. Wow, the five entire, people on the plane. Yeah, many times. I mean, they're, they're, they got to they tell me it was the best time to fly. <laughs> you all missed it. <laughs> it was, I, was, I was out there I was out there flying. You should have told Shatra. should have been right there. Exactly. Uh, but we are, we are in a position where we know at Delta our people are our strength, our, and we've always said that. It's our, it's our number one asset. People think our, our, our big assets are the planes we fly. It's the people that fly them. It's the people that serve our customers. It's the people that fix them and the, the people that take the reservation calls. And those are our heroes. Those are our best assets. But the pandemic exposed elements of wellness and resilience that we had never seen before. We had never, as a society, at least in the last hundred years, had our physical health threatened mm. by an invisible virus, mm. and that that threatened our well-being, threatened our business, but more importantly, threatened our. our so we leaned into heavily to, to covering our people, creating testing. We were the one, maybe the first company out there testing all of its employees. June of 2020, we had testing. It was extraordinarily expensive. We we owned it. We tested all of our people, and by the way, we found thousands and thousands of people who are asymptomatic with the virus wow. and we stopped the virus every single time because that virus would have been passed on to someone else and replicated and doubled. And the, the doctors at Mayo said, we saved an enormous amount of life by, by doing the testing early and get, getting out in front of it. And it's, you know, it's one of the things I'm most proud of in terms of what we've done. We, we put, you know, the, the, everyone's been affected by the emotional Mm -hmm. uh, impact and, and, and what we've been through. And mm -hmm. so we, we don't call it mental wellness anymore. It's your emotional health. Mm -hmm. And there's not a single person in this room that hasn't been touched by what has happened, what we've been through over the last. And some people have been touched worse than others. Yeah. And so we've put counselors into the workplace, not just financial, but, but health counselors. And we've hired uh, trained psychiatrists and psychologists and medical teams. And Henry Tang, who's my new chief health officer from the Mayo Clinic, is wow. awesome, awesome guy, and leading that whole charge. It's all about taking care of our people. And, chief and meeting, medical? Yeah, chief health officer. Chief health officer. Yeah, yeah, he was one of the top guys from Mayo's now reports directly to me as our chief health, health officer. 
the, the financial well-being. In the past, most companies, and by the way, most companies still to this day, you know, I pay you a fair wage, it's your job to figure out what to do with it, it's not my job. Mm. And if you screw up, I, you, know, you can't hold me, mm. hold me responsible. Well, I, you know, that, that's not okay, mm. because we know financial wellness sits at the, the foundation of a lot of other issues and, yeah. and creates other issues. So bringing hope into the workplace. And by the way, thank you for what you've done in terms of providing us those, those counselors. In the, in the last number of months, I, I think we had Financial Wellness Month a couple months ago, uh, we've had over 1,500 people sign up in the space of 60 days, and we've done 1,000 appointments. And from credit counseling to how to get my loans, loans in order to how do I start to prepare a budget, and it just keeps going and going. And by the way, it's not just for the younger employees or the people lower on, on some of the wage scales. You know, it's our pilots. It's other other people that are also engaging. Because just because you have more money doesn't mean you have you don't have problems. Many times you have bigger problems. Yeah. Yeah. Mon money, money. Yeah. You know, it doesn't discriminate. It goes after everyone in terms of some some of its issues. And then the social issues, knowing that whether it's the uh, diversity and, and equity and inclusion challenges, sustainability, which is a big challenge, the governance issues we have yeah. with our with our political system. So it's it's a complicated world. And in the past, we used to leave that to, you know, we just kind of take a piece of that. Yeah. Well, I can't figure out all that stuff, but I'm just going to keep my head down yeah. and try to make money and just kind of keep moving through before. The world is, too, is interconnected now. Mm. And if your best, best asset are your people, the most important thing you can do to invest in their wellness and they will do amazing things for you as you move forward. And that's our strategy, pure and simple. You get a return on investment. Yeah, you get, you get an amazing return. And by the way, you grow generations. This is a generational investment that you're making because they bring new people in. Our hiring brands, and every company in America is having a hard time finding finding talent, not Delta. You know, we're, we're having thousands and tens of thousands of people apply to try to come in, and it's great. We've already hired 8,000 people this year. Wow. And, 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 it's, and it's something that... 10%. Because, because cause, cause they, they realize that the, the quality, the hiring brand, is about the, the care that people take for each other. And that's a company they want to be part of. Yeah, as we wrap up, uh, and I could talk to Ed all day. As we wrap up, um, I was I want to tell this quick story. I was at doing a town hall at Delta Airlines. I want to commend Tim Mapes and Joanne Smith and other leaders there who are so uh, key to uh, this shared success of yours. Um, I was doing this town hall, and I was talking about the the cost of smoking. And I was saying, if you make thirty six thousand dollars a year, and you go to Starbucks three times a week and you, to you smoke two packs of cigarettes a day, that's $6,000 a year, that's 20% of your income. You know, there's two ways to make money, make more or spend less, you're taxing yourself 20% and you're killing yourself. Um, and you need to go get you some Folgers or a mm -hmm. Keurig at the house and stop smoking. So uh, one, uh, Leilani Campbell, who's one of our PR people, was outside and she told me, she called me, she said, John, a maintenance guy at Delta, who was doing the lawns or something, maintenance guy, he was overhearing the conversation inside. And he said, that, well, that John Hope Bryant was saying and, and Ed about smoking, he says, I think I'm gonna stop smoking. She says, well, well did you finally get a hot about your health? He says, no, no, I've been smoking for a long time. I knew it was bad for me. But he told me it cost me $6,000 a year. <laughs> <laughs> it's killing my wallet, I'm gonna stop smoking. So <laughs> we, we <laughs> We're saving lives, saving uh, lives. indirectly. Changing lives, it's awesome. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in saying thank you to one of the greatest CEOs in America. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.